Hey guys, welcome back to Roundtable Talk, where I dissect, analyse and review the latest releases as well as some old classics. Joining me here as we reach the end of Drake season as we come to his most recent album, Scorpion, where I'll take a deep dive into side A and then side B. For me, it feels like just the other day that, that Scorpion came out, um, such has been the, the longevity of the music on this body of work, and obviously the, the amount of tracks on this body of work. So yeah, this will be less a, a nostalgia tour, um, as previous revisits have had, and more just to look back at you know, recent history as it pertains to Drake, um, and you know, uh, maybe a little bit of insight into where we might see him headed on uh, Certified Lover Boy, which is now slated to be released at the beginning of uh, 2021. Yeah, before I do, you know, jump into this deep dive, please do remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and follow me on all the social links below. Really appreciate that. And if you are, you know, a big Drake fan, please do jump back uh, across the channel. There'll be a playlist link below uh, of the full Drake season, uh, starting all the way from uh, Room for Improvement, going through all of his albums, you know, including uh, Thank Me Later, Comeback Season, uh, Nothing Was the Same, If Reading Is It's Too Late, More Life, Views, Scorpion, all of them are in there, all of my reactions, all of my revisits, um, and as I said, you know, in-depth analysis on the, the themes and, and the topics that I guess are addressed as Drake undergoes his uh, artistic progression uh, through his project. But yeah, let's dive into Scorpion, side A. So, back in 2009, all the way back just before the release of, of So Far Gone, Drake released the track Successful, you know, his, probably his, his breakout single, um, and on that track uh, he said, diss me and you'll never hear a reply for it. Um, looking back on it now, uh, a very, very ironic line when you fast forward to, you know, recent years and how times have changed. I would say Scorpion, particularly Side A, uh, is one uh, backhanded reply to the events that surrounded that time period uh, featuring, you know, Kanye West and Pusha T. And although Scorpion really is sort of expertly produced, studied with gems and grappled with a lot of, you know, very relatable issues and anti Drake, you know, delving into his uh, his mindset and his emotions more so than ever, maybe. It's a project that, you know, is, is in my opinion very bloated, um, but also one that tries to do uh, far too many things as a result of the beef, uh, I feel. You also see Drake really audibly trying to sort of explain himself, you know, in parts really apologetic and in other parts tries to, you know, construct a, a narrative uh, around what happened uh, in, in 2018. And yeah, despite some you know, very high highs on this project, I would say that it is quite a uh, fatiguing uh, album experience. I think that's probably the best way to kind of describe it. But let's rewind a little bit. You know, post More Life, uh, Drake kind of, you know, not gives up, but stops his kind of dancehall experimentation. Uh, he released a track called Signs uh, to go along with a, uh, a Louis Vuitton uh, runway show. And while that track is fantastic, it is also a, a pretty, I would say, probably the last true uh, attempt at dancehall from, from Drake up until this point anyway. So I think, you know, sonically, it is clear that Drake uh, was moving in a very different direction, especially uh, with the, uh, the leaks uh, around that time period, all were uh, very much more uh, up-tempo and filled with a lot more joy. And uh, I think that follows on from uh, what I said on my previous revisit to More Life, where the trajectory of that project sees Drake throughout it, uh, find a piece that he hasn't really had since uh, 2015, um, and finding that piece through the music of different cultures and, and just doing the things that he enjoys. And then, as I said, it's no surprise that post More Life, um, he, it sees him draw a line under all of the beefs that he uh, was pretty much embroiled in uh, over the last, you know, two, three, four years. He met with Tory Lanez in Toronto and squashed any issues they had um, uh, in a beef that was, you know, threatening to cause violence uh, in the actual city. He brought Meek Mill and Chris Brown out uh, on a stage with him during the tour during that time period and clearly reignites a, a friendship with Meek and starts to build one with Chris Brown, which would then lead to, you know, collaborations like Going Bad and No Guidance to follow uh, the year later. And he also continued to work closely with uh, Kanye West flying out to Wyoming to, to help write uh, and work with uh, on new music for both himself and, uh, and Kanye in the early part of 2018, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and of course, previously, he'd uh, already patched up his uh, uh, his beefs or his the tension between both himself and Kendrick and between uh, himself and The Weeknd, as well as Diddy and Jay-Z. A lot of beefs, really, isn't there? Um, but yeah, Drake kicked off the year, as he usually does, uh, releasing a, a two-pack, as you might call it, with a couple of tracks. Uh, one, Diplomatic Immunity, uh, which was very, you know, bar-heavy Drake. Saw him, saw him address uh, baby mother rumours, 
um, but kind of swatting them away as he has done and had done over the past two years. He mentioned on 30 for 30, um, getting paternity tests for women he never slept with, and you know you could hear it on uh, certain tracks on More Life where he does mention uh, the, the prospect of having a child in a very sort of dismissive uh, kind of way. And then alongside Diplomatic Community, he also released God's Plan uh, after, it ha after bits of it having leaked uh, online. Um, and God's Plan would obviously go on to become the, the lead single for, for his next project. Um, a track that you know was full of sort of victorious energy, but one that we'll analyse uh, in a bit more depth when we get to it on, on the actual revisit. And God's Plan really started off a, uh, a real summer of, uh, a real year of domination again from Drake in 2018, maybe more so than ever before. Um, building on the sort of pop status that he'd had uh, ever since Views, but going on a feature run on the likes of Look Alive by, by Blockboy JB, appearing on uh, Migos' Walk It Like I Talk It, French Montana's No Stylist, as well as branching into other genres as well, like reggaeton with uh, Bad Bunny, and then of course, as I said, God's Plan, and second single, Nice For What, absolutely just running the summer. Two tracks that, in my opinion, are, are very different for, from anything that Drake had done up until this point. Uh, nice For What, obviously, including a, a great sample, but delving into uh, New Orleans The Bounce, um, and God's Plan kind of being a, a pop mumble rap hybrid that somehow against all odds really works. And both tracks went on to be Drake's biggest singles ever. And then as always with Drake, there's always a, a relationship, uh, you know, shadow, I guess, cast over each project. Um, back in, you know, 2016, something I didn't mention on my More Life revisit was that back in 2016 when Drake was working with uh, Rihanna again uh, on, you know, tracks like Work and Too Good uh, around the Views era, um, he did, he confessed to loving her at an award show, um, as well as, you know, kissing her on stage when he brought her out on tour. But it feels as though uh, around that era, um, her sort of uh, rejection, uh, I guess, of him at that award show um, kind of drew the line uh, under that relationship. Um, and I think is also what led to Drake being able to sort of build a friendship with Chris Brown in that they both had by that point let Rihanna completely go. But as I said on More Life, uh, I think uh, around that period of time, you know, Drake wrote the track Teenage Fever, where he, he kind of moved on from Rihanna to uh, a brief relationship with Jennifer Lopez. Um, and as I said, uh, spent a lot of time uh, that following summer, the summer of uh, 2017 uh, in the UK, where it seems as though Drake uh, struck up a relationship with uh, a woman significantly younger than himself, um, rumoured to be uh, Georgia Smith, or uh, another UK artist called Ray. Um, it's not very clear, but it is clear that uh, the majority of, of side B of Scorpion seems to be directed uh, at this woman. The reason it seems as though it was Georgia is that she was added to more life at uh, a you know, very late stage, and the grime and danceful influences uh, really do make sense when you when you see where Drake was spending the majority of his time during the recording of, of More Life and Post Views. The fallout of that relationship does seem to be explored on, on the second half of, of Scorpion, but it's clear that Scorpion itself, as a body of work, as an album, as a project, was probably going to be, you know, a lot more, uh, a lot more focused on that relationship, um, more so than anything else, in my opinion. Um, prior to uh, Drake falling into this beef with, with Pusha T, um, and it, it, it seems clear that Scorpion underwent a, a lot of restructuring, a lot of additional tracks following the the, the few months uh, between you know the beef and. The release of his album in, in June. The Pusha T beef, uh, as well as you know, the tension between Kanye West and Drake, uh, has, is something that's been really well documented uh, on both my revisits and you know during that time period. Kanye's resentment for Drake really does date back to, to 2010, where Drake kind of swooped in and built on uh, the sound of 808s and Heartbreaks and, and took it to a new direction and took it to a new level and uh, sort of, as Drake has always done, synthesised the best elements f from that kind of sound and turned them into something that's more palatable on a mainstream level. And despite, you know, Kanye's clear, uh, it feels, uh, you know, underhand and destructive tendencies uh, towards Drake uh, it, during that time period, um, it is clear that, like so many artists uh, of, of this era, uh, Drake just absolutely adored and, and revered Kanye as somebody who uh, influenced him even before, uh, before they were so-called rivals. But yeah, prior to More Life, Drake released the track Two Birds, One Stone, which included uh, a few lines responding to Pusha T's uh, subliminal disses uh, over the past few years. 
with Pusha having you know continued tension with Birdman, Lil Wayne, and also Drake. But as the story goes, um, Drake was obviously working with Kanye West uh, over in Wyoming, helping Kanye put together uh, you know Ye the Ye album, as well as talking about the direction of, of Drake's latest uh, latest project. Uh, Drake, as he tells it, would then leave Wyoming to uh, find out that Kanye was you know planning to release his album, uh, as well as all of the artists signed to his label. Uh, their projects in the lead up to and around uh, Drake's release date of Scorpion, the release date of which Drake had uh, told Kanye, as well as talking about his, at that time, secret child. They would also see on that first uh, album, Pusha T's Daytona, uh, there was a track called Infrared, which contained, uh, in my opinion, really slight and small uh, Drake diss, but obviously, again, it was a uh, something that Drake couldn't really fathom and you know I can understand it from his point of view that this was on a track produced by Kanye West uh, discrediting Drake uh, for writing bringing up Quentin Miller's name again uh, the ghostwriter who Drake worked with uh, back in 2015 on this reading is it's too late which in itself led to the mid meal beef but it's clear that Drake felt uh, a huge level of disrespect um, that this track produced by Kanye West um, would be allowed to be put out uh, against him, uh, despite you know the, the tension between himself and Pusha T. But again, now in hindsight, it's clear that that track was purely the bait for for Pusha to you know really take a uh, real aim on his second diss track. Drake released uh, the Duppy freestyle, which you know confirmed all of this stuff about him working with Kanye West um, and dissed Pusha T. In my opinion, a, a very clever and witty way as we have expected from Drake when he's engaged in these sort of conflicts. But Pusha T, uh, you know, in a fantastic uh, chess move, had the uh, the story of Adidon ready to respond to Drake with, uh, and on that track, you know, dissed Drake's family, his producer, um, as well as revealing to the world uh, his baby mother, as well as his uh, newborn child. There's no denying the, the shock value and the, the potency of Pusha's diss uh, it's clear, in my opinion, that Drake lost that conflict, um, uh, despite what he says about you know uh, having a, a secret track recorded. There really isn't anything uh, that we, as a you know a hip hop culture, really care too much uh, to find out about Pusha T. And, and while there may have been something about Kanye West that Drake had uh, you know unearthed, it's clear that why I see you know the Duppy freestyle as a lyrically better track. Um, Pusha T just, just has the content. There's just nothing more to be said really on that. And in that sense, he always had uh, the upper hand. The salaciousness of Adidon was always going to be a massive body, body blow to, to Drake's reputation uh, and to just his own pride. And in the wake of all of that, it's clear that you know Drake uh, took major offense to, to those revelations as well as the disses towards 40, who obviously suffers from MS. Uh, something that, again, you know, Pusha T maybe went a little bit too far in that, but Drake did mention, uh, you know, Pusha T's fiance by name on Duppy Freestyle, so uh, I'm sure he probably thought it was fair game. In the wake of all of that, uh, it's clear that, you know, Drake really did want to respond. And, and while I do agree that there probably was a track recorded, um, I can't see how it could uh, possibly have revealed anything really about Pusha T. Um, it may have revealed, as I said, it may have revealed stuff about Kanye West, um, but it seems as though, uh, and what we'll see more in Scorpion as well, is that Drake didn't really want this to be a, a rap beef anymore. It looks as though this conflict was going to turn to violence. But of course, uh, that side of the beef was deaded by uh, Jay Prince, who's you know, a, a mob-affiliated uh, character <laughs> in rap, but that didn't stop uh, Scorpion being completely restructured with lots of tracks uh, recorded you know post the beef and in my opinion uh, led to the uh, division of side a and the side b and ostensibly rap focus side and r&b focus side and the rap focus side is pretty much as i said before one long backhanded reply to both kanye west and pusher and an attempt to you know uh, readjust the narrative rewrite the myths that you know Kanye West apparently uh, told Pusha T about Drake's child and that's how he found that information despite Pusha T saying that it came from 40 and a woman that he was talking to at the time but yeah despite Drake saying uh, that you know this was all based on you know Biggie's life after death to try and have a, a, a really long body of work that had loads and loads of hits on there um, it's clear that you know, Drake felt uh, uh, an obligation to almost half respond for outside A and then all of this other sort of uh, heartbreak, downbeat music uh, that he'd written 
based on the fallout of his relationship with uh, George Smith. He just clearly couldn't find a way to, to mesh those together. In my opinion, there's a solid album in there if you remove you know, lots of the tracks that serve very little purpose other than to address the beef. But I will say it's still very impressive that he's able to put out 25 tracks and there's probably only two or three bad tracks among them. The rest are, are at least passable, um, which is impressive in my opinion for, for that amount of music. So yeah, it's clear that, you know, going into Scorpion, once again, the trajectory that he'd felt, the peace that he found at the end of More Life was completely derailed uh, by the beef and the knock to his pride. Um, and it saw Drake, in my opinion, uh, fall into some of his worst tendencies in that in putting together this body of work he tried to please everybody he tried to have the, the big pop singles that had run this summer which you know he was quite successful with um, appease the, the hip-hop critics calling for him to respond by having a, a full rap side um, as well as having this you know R&B down tempo side which in my opinion is his comfort zone um, Again, as I've said before, I think Drake's at his best when he brings all aspects of his artistic identity together and by separating them, I, I think he put himself at a, a bit of a disadvantage. But let's not waste any more time. Let's dive into side A, the, the rap focus side with the intro, Survival. All of this disorder, no address, and the crown is broken in pieces, but there's more in my possession. I've had real Philly niggas try to write my ending, taking shots with the gold and talking about shots that we send in. I, I am a cream of the crop nigga. You niggas pop mollies. My mollies pop niggas. Wasn't this cold at the start? There's a hole in my heart. Yeah, this is God's plan, young man. You said it yourself. This just the intro. Let me not get ahead of myself. While not one of Drake's most stunning intros, uh, I think Survival does a really good job in the sense of building on uh, the anticipation that we as a hip-hop audience had for Drake responding to Pusha T or Kanye West at some point on this album. As you'll have seen on, on my previous revisits, something that Drake's always been quite good at really, I, I would say probably all the way back to If Reading This Is Too Late, uh, has been uh, the legend building uh, around himself and the way he speaks or on this track, the way that it's written, makes it very much feel as though he's letting you into this kind of uh, this secret, this conspiracy uh, against Drake and, and why he can't respond. But the imagery around the crown uh, that he talks about, the piece of the crown, uh, is, is really vivid and again really well written. He mentions, you know, his biggest beefs with, with Diddy, with Meat, with Jay, um, and, and how he's reconciled all of those. And again, attempts to sort of re reaffirm his called street credentials, hinting at the beef that with Pusha T is now beyond rap and was on the verge of, of being something a lot more violent. Again, suggesting that he or you know thought about ordering a hit through his um, mob ties on Pusha T and, and potentially Kanye West, or resorting to the type of name calling you saw on sort of 90s rap disses. I think one of my biggest problems with Scorpion is that uh, it kind of rehashes a lot of the, the themes and the, the, the motifs that if you're reading this it's too late addressed uh, really really well and I think Scorpion just doesn't do it in uh, such a succinct and uh, effective way um, and as I said it's a, a project that is just a little bit all over the place and you see that in, in Drake's raps uh, in that a lot of them are, are very all over the place which is not like him um, but also, as I said, there seems to be you know two or three different types of cohesive albums all squashed into one uh, in Scorpion. And, and while I think Survival is a good start, it, it, it kind of loses its way uh, quite quickly. Interesting as well that there's not very much 40, uh, again, on this project as a producer, much like the last two projects, but it still maintains this really sort of bleak, sparse atmosphere, uh, which is quite a contrast, I think, to some of the warm music on Views, uh, as well as the really warm music on, on More Life. Another great line on here as well is the, uh, the Hole In My Heart line, uh, which seems to you know confirm that Drake that, that the peace that Drake found at the end of More Life has been completely shattered with his credibility uh, in hip hop um, uh, as well as his pride as a man uh, all being really uh, attacked uh, in 2018. The final lines of Survival do kind of suggest that more is coming. That this is only the intro. I don't know. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Unfortunately, I think again you know Survival is a bit of a tease in that it's a, a build up to, to, to pretty much nothing. The implication is that Drake has this kind of, has some sort of knowledge that he can't share because of, you know, Jay Prince or, or, or some kind of 
moral obligation, I don't know, but it is, you know, a, a biting and indignant opener, but it just doesn't really sort of come to a, a full fulfillment, uh, in my opinion, anyway. Um, I will say the beat, the video, as I've mentioned before about having less 40, uh, the, the video game beat uh, is a really interesting choice. Um, and again, it sounds very different to, to the majority of, of More Life and it feels very much recorded in, in the aftermath of Beef. It's interesting again to think what might have been the intro had this Beef not happened. But yeah, it's a, a heavy intro, uh, one that again feels the weight of, of what's all been going on in Drake's life. And I do wonder for, for people who had only really listened to you know the big singles uh, around this time period, what they must have thought hearing this kind of opener. Um, but yeah, let's dive into track two called Nonstop. I just flip the switch. Flip, flip. Hey, this a rolling, not a stop. Why shit don't never stop? This the flow that got the block hot. Niggas pulling gimmicks cause they scared of rap. Funny how they shook. Hey, got you niggas shook. Pulling back the curtain by myself. Take a look. Hey. Future took the business and ran it for me. I let Ollie take the aisle, told him brand it for me. Got to give me. Then I prayed again. You rain till I get a wedding ring. Oh, yeah. And you know it's King Slime, Drizzy Dan. Oh, yeah. She just said I'm bad. I hit the thizzle dance, man. Drake shit. Money for revenge, man. That's hardly an expense. Fuck what they got going on. I gotta represent. Hey. Non stop's an absolute banger. Maybe a little bit ruined by uh, the TikTok uh, craze that, you know, followed with this song. Um, but yeah, it's suitably menacing. Uh, Tay Keith was really the, the man of the moment in the summer of 2018, uh, producing you know stuff for Skepta, Blockboy JB, um, ASAP Rocky, um, and he really does follow through with a really m monstrous instrumental and brings out you know some of Drake's best sort of ad lib game, uh, which is something that he really did improve. Um, I, I would say probably in the lot in the latter half of his career, his uh, the, the energy and the personality that he brings to you know a track or an ad lib. And his mic presence really just improved with every single project and non-stops are a really great example of it you know again synthesizing uh you know the type of style that migos have brought to the table and already added that sort of element to, to hip-hop it's aggressive uh feels you know fairly effortless uh a little bit sort of grime influenced um you know maybe that's just the uh the due to the sort of london shout out and gigs appearing in the video for it um but there's quotables for days, full of confidence. Some really silly lines as well, but they're all really, really, but all really memorable. And it's all brought together by Drake's sort of, again, menacing delivery. And you can really hear that there's something on Drake's mind, uh, a real sort of sinister aggression in this track. And uh, on uh, an interview around the time uh, with uh, LeBron James, uh, Drake confirmed that Nonstop was one of the tracks recorded uh, in the aftermath of the beef uh, and added to Scorpion quite late on. It shows, in my opinion, the strength of, of Drake as an artist and, and as a writer that he's able to make hits of, of this calibre that, you know, other artists, other rappers would kill for, uh, even when he's backed against the wall. In a really short space of time, he's still able to make uh, hits of, of this level. But yeah, uh, I'm, I'm also a, a huge fan of, of when Drake allows his more uh, Memphis roots and influences to come into his music, and the sample really pays homage to that. Um, something that Drake really does try to do, I think, on, on pretty much every project. Um, but yeah, non-stop, great track. It doesn't really build on what survival kind of uh, suggests is to follow. But anyway. Despite that, non stop, bit of a banger. Let's move on to the next track, Elevate. Elevate, elevate. Only obligation is to tell it straight. I'm in better weight, thinking how to make all this happen for myself and my family. If you need me, you can call me. I stay busy working on me. She is not a type that lets you take things slowly. I wanna thank God for working way harder than Satan He's playing favorites, it feels amazing There's no way that this is real, man, it can't be I can only tell you shit in pieces As it happens to me, I begin to write the thesis My mood is changing this summer, I'ma be tweaking Honestly, never been a, a huge fan of Elevate. It does sound to me as though it's a, a song that maybe he should have given to, to somebody else, like uh, you know French Montana, for example, who has a, a really brief appearance on this track. Um, but it is one of those tracks that I think, again, really reflects the, the state of mind that Drake was in around this time. Lyrically, all over the place, every single 
every line uh, addressing something totally different. But I think Elevate is probably one of the best tracks on side A in, in getting across uh, the, the anger in Drake, the difficulty he, he's having around this time in, in you know, making peace with his own pride. Um, he again talks about insomnia, something that seems to have troubled him uh, since uh, 2015 and, and the paranoia uh, that he's experienced uh, pretty much since then. The beat is really echoey, ominous, but again, does see Drake uh, thank thank a higher power for his place and for his life and for his place in the industry. There's elements of Elevate that you know should be really joyous, considering what he's talking about. But there is an underlying tone of sadness that clings to pretty much every single word. I would say as well, you know, it is fairly experimental for Drake in terms of uh, both, as I said, the ominous beat and, and the cadence that he's using. Around this time period, uh, he, he had taken again to sort of stretching his voice. I think on Elevate it really does work, but on other tracks or on Scorpio it doesn't work quite so well. I do enjoy his uh, his final verse uh, as well quite, quite a lot, the one that begins. I can only tell you this in pieces. It's a line in a verse that I think really does sum up, uh, you know, Drake as a writer, his career, in that he's only able to talk about, you know, things that have actually happened to him, so he does have to have, you know, periods of time or th that are full of life experience. Um, as well as, again, in my opinion, uh, implying that there is more to come on, on revealing why he hasn't responded or what might have been included uh, in this response. And again, just builds the, 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 the the conspiracy narrative uh, but yeah uh, elevate it's okay uh, again like i said not one of my favorites um let's move on to the next track called emotionless don't link me don't hit me when you hear this and tell me your favorite song beating all my heroes like seeing how magic works breaking speed records on roads that these niggas paid and they don't like that it's written all on their face leaving me to ask is there anybody like me i always hear people complain about the place that they live that all the people here are fake and they got nothing to give because they've been staring at somebody else's version of shit look at the way we live i wasn't hiding my kid from the world i was hiding the world from my kid all these followers but who gonna follow me to the end the drums on emotion is absolutely crazy aren't they but while I guess the division between uh, rap and R&B, in my opinion, wasn't the smartest uh, artistic move for, for Drake, Side A is obviously you know the closest we've gotten or will get to uh, a straight rap uh, Drake album. I think Scorpion Side A really does present the case, uh, in my opinion, um, and again I'm sure people will disagree with me on this, um, that Drake, is, Drake as an artist is probably at his least interesting on traditional hip hop production. I think, you know, his bars are, you know, consistently incisive on this record. But as I've mentioned on previous revisits, um, I think that when Drake is on, you know, typical soul sample boom bap, um, he does have this tendency to rap in a really mechanical way, in a way that I feel really does restrict him. There's several tracks on uh, Scorpion that feel like that. Um, they feel as though uh, Drake feels he has something to prove uh, as as an MC, um, which stops him from you know being as fluid as maybe he should be uh, with all the weapons in his sort of musical arsenal. And it's a shame because uh, I think content-wise, Scorpion probably is as you know forthright uh, about Drake's life um, as potentially since nothing was the same. The Mariah Carey sample is obviously you know beautifully put together. Um, and, and as I said as well, wrapped around such a, a thumping and booming bass line. And I do really enjoy, uh, despite as I said, the somewhat formulaic sort of tone, I do really enjoy uh, you know, Drake's second verse. It's the most conscious uh, of Drake you'll ever get. Um, it's, a, it's a real modern form of conscious hip hop, something that Drake, I think, pretty much pioneered. Talking about you know, the damaging effect of you know, internet culture or on both himself, um, but also on, uh, on how it affects other people as well. And I think that kind of rapping and that kind of content is something that Drake doesn't really get enough credit for for uh, bringing into you know, hip hop, uh, both mainstream and underground. This beat is apparently uh, produced by No ID, uh, as, well as, for, uh, as well as with some extra production from 40. Um, and I find it interesting that, you know, this is, I think, the first time ever that Drake has ever worked with No ID, who happens to be Kanye West's mentor 
on a album that is full of, of a lot of not so subtle not Kanye West disses. Another track uh, to add to the catalogue of Drake uh, addressing a fear of death, but I think it's one that I said I don't love this song, uh, which you know, might be a little bit controversial, but I, I do think it really does well in really epitomising the, the major theme, I think, of, of Scorpion uh, pretty much uh, across the board, not just side A, but, but side B too, which I think is probably loneliness at the top. And while that's something that Drake has you know, addressed in bits uh, all across his career, I think he does it the most on, on Scorpion. On side A, it feels as though Drake is feeling loneliness within rap uh, and within his position at the top of the game and the betrayals that he's faced uh, across the years. And then on side B, it's a loneliness in terms of love, relationships and fatherhood. Yeah, of course, on this track, Drake also uh, admits uh, to having a child. Um, uh, and, you know, at the time, I maybe didn't enjoy it, but the way that he actually says it in such a, a straightforward, matter-of-fact kind of way is kind of refreshing. Much of this track uh, seems to directly address uh, the story of Adidon. Yeah, but despite having that moment, uh, he does also say he feels exhausted and drained, he can't even pretend. And uh, I think that sort of uh, feeling is something buried within all of Scorpion um, and it's something that's been buried in Drake's music for quite some time. But yeah, while objectively Emotionless is a, a, a great song, great rapping, great beat, um, it, it, it's one for me that doesn't quite click and I'm not too sure why. Let me know what you think in the comments though. Um, but yeah, let's move on to the next track, a, a, a little known song called, uh, called God's Plan. I've been moving calm, no start no trouble with me. Trying to keep it peaceful is a struggle for me. I don't wanna die for them to miss me. Yes, I see the things that they wishing on me. God's plan. God's plan. I hold back sometimes I won't. Yeah. Might go down to G-O-D. Yeah. Bad things. It's a lot of bad things that they wishing and wishing and wishing. She say, do you love me? I tell her only partly. I only love my bed and my mom. I'm sorry. 50 dub. I even got it tatted on me. And you know me. Turn the O2 into the O3, dog. God's plan. I can't do this on my own. A record-breaking single, uh, as well as being a, an innovative one uh, as well in the, uh, at the time, nothing really sounded like God's plan. Um, and I, I still personally, uh, I'm not sure how it became so successful and why it works uh, so well, but it just really does. Um, in terms of where it fits in Scorpion, it really is a shot of adrenaline uh, amongst, you know, this album's uh, bleak and very paranoid sort of opening few tracks. Uh, but I will say that I think uh, both God's Plan and uh, Nice For What and Where They're Placed uh, on both sides of this album uh, do suffer a little in that they are very out of place, especially in terms of tone. But I think there is an album within Scorpion that uh, was definitely a little bit more joyous, a little bit more uh, focused on uh, both self-empowerment and the empowerment of others, um, which I think would have been a very interesting direction to hear from Drake, especially at this point of his career. Um, but again, as I said, you know, beef, and women uh, derailed that uh, for this project at least. Maybe we'll see more of that on, on Drake's next album. You know, Laugh Now, Cry Later is a pretty joyous track in itself too. Maybe not lyrically, but in, in terms of tone. God's Plan, absolute smash hit. Brings together, uh, you know, elements of, of mumble rap, as I said, synthesizing those sort of more innovative ways for, for the mainstream that Drake does in a, a really fantastic way. Probably his greatest gift, um, but also brings together uh, uh, and brings to a head, I guess, the references that Drake has had to, to higher powers guiding his career, um, which is something that he's brought up uh, on a lot of different tracks, on a lot of different projects over the past five years. And while on the surface it is really, uh, you know, feel good, victorious, um, lyrically, it is, you know, there are elements in there that are a little bit dark on here. Again, it addresses Drake's fear of death, um, but again, it's about putting his faith and his life and his continued success in in the hands of something outside of himself, it, it, in this case, you know, a, a higher power. But it really is, uh, at, despite being a smash, a really unlikely hit. There's a lot of very specific uh, London uh, and Toronto references um, that could be quite alienating, but they just seem to work. Uh, I think just his use of melody and cadence on this track is just outstanding. That It proves, I think, that Drake can pretty much say anything um, but it's the way that he says it, 
which is what separates him from his peers. But yeah, just a, an absolute masterpiece of a single. And as I said, just proof that as long as Drake's mastery of, of melody and flow uh, remain, um, I don't think his success is gonna slow down uh, anytime soon. Um, but yeah, God's Plan, unfortunately for me, it is followed by potentially my least favorite Drake song of all time called I'm Upset. I'm upset. 50,000 on my head is disrespect. Got a lot of blood and it's cold. They keep trying to get me for my soul. Can't go 50 50 with no hope. I still got like seven years of doing what I want. My dad still got child support from 1991. He said, made me feel like someone tried their best. Yeah. On a waste of half a million, be my guest. I'm upset is a terrible, terrible song. Um, and it's not often that you'll hear me say that uh, about a Drake track. Um, I think you know you can go back through uh, every single revisit uh, I've ever done. You'll find it difficult to find me defining a Drake song as bad. But um, yeah, I think I'm upset. It's one of those. It's 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 one of those ones that I just listen to and I, and I honestly wonder what he was thinking. His delivery on this is uh, uncharacteristically bad. Um, the beat is really weird and empty and the, the release of this as a single is absolutely baffling badly timed as well in the this was i think the third single so the one that directly preceded uh the release of the album and actually came out uh just after uh, duppy freestyle as drake said that he wanted to move on from the beef um, and continue to promote his own album he said that this track had nothing to do with the beef despite the content seeming very uh, related to, to what was you know uh, he to what he was uh, accused of um in, in terms of uh, fathering a child and, and not taking care of him but this track was i think followed by a story of added on about like four four days later completely blew duppy uh, and this terrible track really out of the water and just makes this track uh, look even worse uh, in hindsight but anyway the 50-50 line uh, it is really obviously ironic. There's also another example of a track where Drake, like the track Charles Play, tries to build up uh, women and in doing so uh, is really condescending and, and kind of you know defeats the point of, of what he's trying to do. It's also really interesting that he shouts out um, ASAP Rocky on, on this track, especially as it was rumoured around this time that uh, ASAP Rocky had actually dated the mother of Drake's child while she was pregnant uh, with, with Drake's child but again all sort of weird gossip uh, around that time um, but yeah the, the only saving grace of, of this pretty terrible song is uh, the video that was released for it which saw a tongue-in-cheek reunion of uh, the Degrassi cast which saw Drake uh, attend like a, a fake high school reunion and uh, I think again it's just a, a great example of Drake not taking his own of taking himself too seriously but also not taking his own uh, his own past and his own history too seriously and that, that video is the only saving grace of, of this track for me and I'm not going to waste too much time talking about it because I really don't enjoy it so let's move on to the next track called 8 out of 10 too rich for who y'all just got rich again who grips the mic and likes to kill their friends if shit was at an 8 we like to we like to we like to yeah Drizzy by the drop, the game is in disarray. I tell you, hear me out, but we both know end of the day. Your sister is pressing play, your trainer is pressing play. Your wifey, your wifey. I gotta breathe real deep when I catch an attitude. And the product is still the best, though. No matter, could I, should I kiss my son on the forehead and kiss your ass goodbye? Hold on, hold up, but I miss making them pay. Hella pad from Will Smith crib straight to the stage. I've been on top of three sets in three years. I think I sense a little fear from the other side. White vans parked across the street, real subtle guys. As luck would have it, I've settled into my role as the good guy. I guess luck is on your side. So obviously, a out of ten is a, a pretty direct response to, to Kanye West. Specifically, references uh, some lines that uh, Kanye had on his album Ye on the track uh, No Mistakes. As I said in my intro, I think you know production is pretty effortless on Scorpion, and I think Boy Wonder really, really shines uh, on this beat. So it's a, a refreshingly soulful track that is clearly intentionally uh, reminiscent of classic Kanye West production, um, and it's fitting that Drake chooses to most directly address Kanye uh, on this beat. He even seems to imitate uh, Kanye flow a little bit at the beginning of the track and dives and then takes a deep dive into you know, Kanye's evident jealousy this and, and, and the resentment that I've mentioned has, has stayed there since pretty much 2010. It's obvious as well on this track that Drake is you know audibly hurt and betrayed by uh, by this betrayal from his idol 
um, having you know supposedly revealed the information to, to Pusha T about his child. Um, but I think Drake's clear sort of distress makes this track all the more satisfying. Again, as, and as I've said previously, it's clear that this kind of conflict does bring out a, a real potency in Drake's writing um, and, and, you know, a, a vicious side as well in that, you know, it is clear that there are references and hints uh, that Drake has had some kind of interaction uh, with Kim Kardashian. It's clear that in tracks like this and in, in tracks like Sicko Mode that, that follow this and, and even in My Feelings, um, Drake plays on uh, Kanye's own insecurity uh, in his own relationship. And the way Kanye reacted to this uh, on Twitter and social media uh, definitely seems to c confirm uh, that, that Drake was pretty successful with, in doing that. The track also ends with uh, you know the viral uh, clip from Plies talking about being mad, and it's one that you know sums up Drake's non-response to, to Pusher in that Drake it kind of suggests that Drake is you know, not as angry about uh, these guys uh, and that he doesn't want to engage with people below his level. And I can, and I can see why to, you know, the uninformed people who aren't really in touch with, you know, hip hop culture, Drake's career, all that kind of stuff. I can see why this sort of narrative would be seen as Drake being cowardly. But on the other hand, um, I think it is clear to those in the know that the real enemy in, in this situation and the real sort of enemy of the, the correct status uh, as well is Kanye West in this battle between Drake and, and Pusher. It's, the real enemy is, is Kanye. As entertaining as it, as it was, there is no real conflict or relationship between, or friendship between Pusher T and Drake. So when there's so much to lose on, on Drake's side, why get involved in it? But uh, yeah, the Kanye West uh, conflict is obviously very much addressed uh, on this, as it is on you know emotionless uh, as well. When he talks about you know breaking speed records on on roads that these guys paved, it mentions a couple of times about pulling back the curtain, which actually is uh, I think a reference to uh, the Wizard of Oz and seeing how your your heroes work and and seeing behind the scenes and and losing your respect uh, for Kanye, which I think is something that. It's clear that Drake has completely lost, especially when you watch, you know, interview his most recent interview with, with Elliot Wilson. It's clear that the, the respect he had for Kanye West uh, as a man is now completely gone. But anyway, uh, let's move on to the next track. One of the standouts, I think, from Side A called Mob Ties. Hey, sick of these niggas, sick of these niggas, hide some help, get rid of these niggas. It is what it is, yeah. GLE, cause that lemon moving fast. Whatever you did. It is what it is, and I'm so tired. I'm fuck with them all, but I got ties. It's too late for all that lovey dovey shit. I am a dog, dog. My bitch is Chanel now. Nah. Your bitch in the spot. Yeah, and he shook. I could tell. I just gave him two for 40 million, like Chappelle. Nah, sick of these niggas. Hide some help. Get rid of these niggas. It's too late for all that. So, as I said, I think Mob Ties is one of the standouts from, from Side A. It's ridiculously catchy, samples a, a, a Nas classic, and I think sees Drake uh, once again experiment with uh, flow and cadence. Uh, obviously there's a very noticeable similarity to the, to the work of you know Travis Scott and Young Thug in the way that he sounds on this track. Um, and I think you know originally Travis Scott was actually slated to appear on this record, as again this track is pretty clearly aimed at uh, Pusha T and Kanye West. Um, it, it may be that Travis Scott was removed in that he has obviously his own ties to good music and, and those two guys as well. Um, but I would say that's a little bit ironic in that Drake then also very directly goes at Kanye on Travis's uh, sicko mode following the release of Scorpion and, and Astro World later in the year. So uh, on that interview that I mentioned before where Drake sits down with uh, LeBron James, uh, he mentioned the likes of, he mentions that a track like Mob Ties was also created in the aftermath of, of the beef. Um, and, and like non-stop is, a, a, is proof that Drake is such a natural hit maker that even under this kind of pressure, under this kind of scrutiny, it seems as though he's noticeably uh, reinvigorated or, or invigorated by the beef. And, and as I've said on previous revisits, there's been plenty of examples of uh, conflict and beef breeding great writing uh, in Drake. One of the most interesting lines I think on this uh, on this song though are is uh, the Louis bag in exchange for body bags. Um, in in that it came in that this album came out not too long after the, the tragic passing of um, XXX Tentacion. Death was linked to uh, being robbed for for some uh, some fashionable items he, he had on his person, but also that Drake was also accused of uh, copying uh, X's flow 
on uh, on the track KMT from More Life. So yeah, I'm not sure if it's a, an intentional reference. If it is, it's a little bit distasteful. Um, but again, it, it, it might just be a, a bit of a coincidence. But yeah, overall, More Tires is a, a great track. Um, Again, sees Drake reaffirming his own credibility through that of his friends, um, liter quite literally in this one, talking about mob ties, referencing the likes of Jay Prince, Baca, people like that, who uh, have more direct ties to, to street life than Drake does. Um, and again, you know, just adds to the implications that Drake has become more involved uh, in this kind of thing as he's got bigger in, in his career behind the scenes while still maintaining that sort of pop image. Um, again, whether you believe that or not, it really is up to you. Despite Drake's uh, clean cut uh, background, it's not something that uh, I find that unbelievable, um, especially, you know, 10 years into the industry. But yeah, do love Mob Ties, very enjoyable song. Um, but yeah, let's move on to the next track called Can't Take a Joke. When I first listened to this record, um, I, I wasn't a huge fan of Can't Take a Joke. It's definitely grown on me though. I personally like to imagine that this track was recorded uh, very close to Drake's uh, to Drake hearing uh, the story of Added On, in that there's a real sort of unhinged element to his cadence and his flow on this. Much like Elevate, there's a real sort of uncontrolled uh, anger in, in this song. Obviously he does a, a bit more of the sort of mob posturing uh, that he did in the, in the previous track. But I'm also a huge fan of, of when Drake is, uh, you know, much more, or at least shows the, the, the self-awareness that he has about himself. Um, you know, whether that's in, you know, tongue-in-cheek videos, which have become very typical of him, or when he directly addresses something uh, in his lyricism. Um, so for example, in this one, he mentions about his pride getting the best of him. Um, and it's clear that, you know, as I said, you know, over the past five years, Beef has really followed him around, um, and his own pride has been uh, a, a large, large factor um, in, in the escalation of, of these beefs as well, or at least the continuation of, of these beefs. Um, but yeah, I, I always enjoy when Drake tries uh, vocal experiments. I will say though, on Can't Take a Joke, he's very close to, if not getting to the point of um, it, pushing his voice to the extremes and pushing his tone to the extremes where it becomes a little bit whiny and you know while this track has a clear bounce to it do you think he pushes his vocals a little bit too far on this one that just comes across a little bit jarring but i think can't take a joke is a a really clear example of the filler that you do get on, on side a um, and i think lends itself to the, the the idea that scorpion was restructured very much at the last minute to try and both address the beef but also include a lot of the music that Drake had obviously been recording for the original Scorpion. And I think that led to adding even more tracks just to bulk this out to this side A and side B concept. The topics on side A are kind of overextended and, and, and really driven into the ground in that a track like Can't Take a Joke uh, doesn't really expand on anything more than mob ties or anything more than emotionless or anything more than eight out of ten and it feels as though a lot of the filler on, on side a could all have just been synthesized into one great track rather than you know three or four just okay tracks um but yeah that's probably my biggest problem with, with, with can't take a joke again it's the point in the album experience where you get a little bit tired of drake just going on and on about his issues with Pusha T and Kanye without really uh, directly addressing it. Um, but yeah, uh, let's move on to the next track. It's called Sandra's Rose. Niggas see the crib and ask who did I steal from? Price tags on making a world fail some. Stack casinos, get all of you niggas scratched like Primo. Two girls that I wrote like Indiana Jones. I make them hoes walk together like I'm Amber Rose. Yeah, I wasn't made for no casket and no prison cell. Every title doing numbers like I'm Mr. Dell. I'm the chosen one and flowers never pick themselves. <laughs> Niggas want a classic, that's just 10 of these. Backstab so many times I started walking backwards. I walk in godly form amongst the mortal men. I don't know who's protecting me, but we hit it off. So Sandra's Rose obviously pairs, you know, the, the very, very modern uh, Drake with the old school sounds of, of DJ Premier for the very first time. Uh, probably one of the most interesting aspects of this song for me um, uh, is is that Drake again is, is very self-aware in that he identifies the, the desire uh, amongst his fan base for Drake to have 
uh, a so-called classic album or a classic body of work. He's quite dismissive of it in that he says, even that he's in that he says on the track, um, a classic is just ten of these. Um, whether that's a reference to ten of uh, this type of uh, old school track or his previous ten bodies of work, um, it, it's not really clear. But but in my opinion, you know, for someone like Drake, who's clearly very uh, in touch with, with rap culture, it does feel it does feel like a deflection. The album notes for Scorpion, or the, or the album description, I think, on Apple Music, um, listed in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way all of the usual criticisms that Drake has had, where, where it says that Drake doesn't rap enough, Drake doesn't sing enough, Drake doesn't write his own lyrics. Um, but what that does, while it's, uh, again, an, an acute awareness of, of what's going on, it does, I think, show Drake's own insecurity about what people say and uh, and I think you know worrying about what people think definitely affected Scorpion. I think many people now would have much preferred Drake to just directly respond to, to Pusha T on a, on a track separate to uh, the Scorpion album and then have Scorpion be completely its own thing but um, I unfortunately didn't go that way but as I said you know Drake is self-aware about the effect that you know, other people's comments do have on him. He talks a bit about it on Emotionless. Even on Can't Take a Joke, he says, uh, back and forth from Italy, my comment section killing me. I would say, though, that I think, from my perspective, I think it's pretty much impossible for Drake to deliver a, you know, a universal consensus uh, classic body of work, mostly due to, you know, the double-edged sword that I've mentioned very much uh, <laughs> in every single revisit, um, which is Drake's versatility. Because at this stage of his career, I think unwilling to sacrifice commercial success for a, a classic record um, and it, it seems as though he really does want to do both and uh, again I think albums like Views and albums like Scorpion show that by you know not committing to one sound not committing to you know the themes he's still attempting to, to please everybody um, and to please the people who love R&B Drake the people who love rap Drake the people who love the people who love pop Drake and until he begins to ignore at least one of those fan bases. I think he's straying further and further away from having albums that are received in the same way as a, a Take Care or Nothing Was The Same. But let's hope Certified Lover Boy at this point, uh, without the, the shadow of beef over it, is going to be uh, a little bit more focused. Anyway, back to Sandra's Rose. Obviously, again, it references uh, Drake being chosen, which follows the, the references to a higher power that Drake has been talking about since more life. And lyrically on this track, obviously, talks about betrayal once again. Um, but it does sound as though on, on Sandra's Rose that he is trying to put the beef to bed. I mean, that he doesn't want to make the mistake of, you know, forgiveness uh, again, um, in specific reference to this current beef. And while, you know, there's plenty, I think, of, of good bars on this record, again, I think it does fall into the trappings of, you know, the usual thing that happens when Drake does a, a so-called rapity rap track, in that it does come across a, a little bit formulaic, um, and in my opinion, you know, again, it might be controversial, but just a little bit unengaging, um, despite, you know, the beat being great and Drake's bars being great, it just lacks a little bit of something. But yeah, let's move on to the next track. It's called Talk Up and features Jay-Z. The obvious standout thing from this track is that Jay-Z verse towards the end. I think he sounds reinvigorated, re-enthused, and this is obviously post-444, uh, which saw a sort of renaissance, I think, for, for Jay-Z as a rapper and as an artist. He definitely steals the spotlight on Talk Up, but while his references to, to X uh, at the end of the verse are, are very good and show the context under which this verse was recorded, um, I would say that Talk Up is probably, you know, the worst of, of Drake and Jay-Z's uh, collaborations. It's, it's okay, but uh, I would say only passable, um, and in my opinion, feels a little bit unfinished. Um, definitely lacks the immediacy of a, a light up or a pound cake. Drake's portion of the track for me is a very strange one. Um, the beat just doesn't really sound like something that you would expect to hear a, a Drake and a, a Jay-Z on. Um, and I think Drake's portion sounds a bit, as I said, unfinished or like a demo. And I think it was confirmed by the producer of this track that this song was put together in a very short amount of time um, to try and meet the deadline 
to, to go on Scorpion. The insinuation or the implication uh, in this in the way this track was put together does suggest that Drake putting Jay on this album, um, regardless of the, the quality of the song, was actually a, a power move and, uh, and yet another thing uh, to get back at, at Kanye. On, on Scorpion, Drake works with Kanye's mentor, No ID, for the first time ever. His brother turned enemy at the time, uh, Jay-Z, with there being tension between those two as well due to Kanye's support of, of Trump and, and other things. Uh, and then later on the album, Drake posthumously working with one of Kanye's uh, artistic idols that he's talked about many times, Michael Jackson. You know, whether, it, whether it's intentional or not, you know, these placements on Scorpion uh, in the context of uh, the conflict with, between Kanye and Drake do really feel like passive aggressive uh, shots and also offer us a glimpse at you know the, the calculated uh, side of Drake that we saw back in 2015 2016 when he, he so viciously uh, disposed of, of Meek Mill as I said though I think talk up again like can't take a joke could easily be removed uh, from this album in that they're not really touching on any new topics um, and they are kind of overrating the point. Um, I, I'd say probably Talk Up is one of my least favourites on this on this album. Not a bad track, just not particular to, to my taste in, in Drake music. But anyway, that actually brings us to the outro of uh, Side A called Is There More? Let's get into it. Only holding up I do is my end of the bargain. Only begging that I do is me begging your pardon. Still I rise, my Angelou vibes. With life coming at you from all angles and sides I'm in control of my destiny, never in doubt If I can't make it with you, I'll make it without Is there more to life than saying I figured it out? Is there more? Sweeter the berry, the black of the juice The boy is back in the booth, ready to tap in the truth In the house playing D'Angelo, how does it feel? I got a fear of having things on my mind Am I missing something that's more important to find? Like healing my soul, like family time Is there more to life than just when I'm feeling alive? Is there more? I think Is There More is definitely a, another standout uh, from Side A. It sounds to me uh, as though this might have been something that was originally on Scorpion. Definitely feels like a either an intro or, or an outro and obviously it does function as, uh, as the outro or, of this side of Scorpion. Um, but it doesn't really feel like it has uh, pride of place uh, amongst the album. Um, obviously buried in the middle of, of such a, a huge amount of music. Really re reflective type of song. And there's an obvious, uh, again, unhappiness and loneliness in the fact that Drake feels like he's not appreciated um, in, in his own time. Obviously that's very much Drake's thing uh, as an artist. Um, but I think this track is, is really well written. Um, the flow is a little bit slow for, for me on this record. And again, it feels a, a little bit of, of a pump fake in you know, the title, um, but, but also in the track itself. Um, loads of you know, plays on words, and as I said, it, it, it's remarkable that he's able to write something that feels uh, like stream of consciousness, but it's obviously so well, but when you read into the lyrics, it's obviously so well constructed. Um, and as I said, it has so many double meanings. By the end of this track, the, it seems as though Drake really isn't going to directly address uh, Kanye and, and Pusher in any kind of vicious way. Um, is there more is kind of the, the final tease, really, before you move on to, to side B, which is a completely different kettle of fish. It's another clear example of Drake trying to find uh, this purpose that he's seeking for. What is this more that he's looking for? Um, something that he's been struggling with uh, since views, uh, all through more life, and as I said, the trajectory of, of more life uh, is very much thrown off uh, by what, what by what follows it. Also, the title I think probably implies that he's only able to tell us certain elements of his life uh, in an, in an R and B type of style, um, rather than o on the rap side, um, which le which leads us into you know the R and B focus side B. And again, I think it's interesting that the the track ends with the lead singer of uh, Hiatus Coyote, I think they're called uh, Napalm or Napalm who was sampled at the beginning of More Life, then gives a rendition of, of Aaliyah's uh, More Than A Woman. Obviously Aaliyah seems as though she was Drake's first female muse, and I think it's interesting that this, this ending to Is There More leads straight into Side, or, or a, a mini project, um, that feels all about his most recent muse, um, whether that's Georgia Smith or, or some other English woman is pretty unclear. But I think it's a good connection, and as I said, I think Is There More is a, a really good lead-in 
to, to side B. But I would say that I, I think it's maybe a little bit of a wasted opportunity in that the, the, the things that he's touching upon uh, in the lyrics would be uh, a really fantastic outro, I think, to the whole project, if maybe built out to, to be a bit more full. Um, but yeah, I, as I said, I think it's a great leader to side B. So to the half of Scorpion that I personally prefer uh, much more. But yeah, we're going to save all of that for, for, for part two, obviously. But yeah, I will dive into what I think of Scorpion uh, as a project um, at the end of uh, you know the next video. But I will say that I think as a, uh, a, a mini album in itself, Side A is, it is just okay to me. As I said earlier, I think it's got you know some really high highs and shows uh, that Drake can can rap with the best of them. Um, but I will say that I think Drake is at his least interesting uh, in this kind of rap. The soundscape is you know uh, quite bleak and, and empty feeling, and I think he does over egg uh, a lot of the topics and just feels like one long effort to to rearrange or to take control of the narrative and to try and again place himself as this sort of uh, someone who is above beef but, but in at the same time uh, showing how much it really has affected him by dedicating 11 or 12 tracks pretty much solely to uh, indirectly uh, addressing uh, the beef. But yeah, as I said, there's some great highs, some great examples of Drake lyricism on this. Um, and some, some real hits um, in God's plan, mob ties and all stop. So yeah, you really can't argue with those. Uh, but yeah, what do you think of, of Side A? Um, let me know in the comments below. Um, and while you're there, please do remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and uh, follow me on all the social links below. Keep an eye out as my revisit to, to Side B is, is coming up soon. I'll also go over you know how my thoughts on Scorpion as a whole. Um, and what I think we can expect uh, from Certified Lover Boy at the beginning of, of next year. Um, but yeah, apart from all that, I hope everyone is staying safe, staying well, staying positive and testing negative. Until side B, I'll say take care and see you there.